If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I also work from home sometimes. Sometimes. There is a good deal of pastoral work that is invisible. Nobody sees it. Like praying. you got to pray a lot. We're a church that prays, and that means talking to God and listening to God. It takes time. I was praying a lot yesterday. I do that as I get ready for the sermons. I want to hear from God. I want to listen. I want to be obedient. Sometimes things come to me about you, and so I encourage you in the obedience. And this all gets worked into the sermon. Most people only see me on a Sunday. That's it. And then a smaller crowd sees me on a Wednesday, and then a smaller crowd might see me during the week, group meetings like staff meeting. But then the rest of my meetings are all one-on-one, a lot of counseling meetings. So sometimes people want them to be private. It will only be me, that other person, and God that knows we had that meeting. Then another large portion of pastoral work is office work, the fun stuff. Everybody loves that. Nobody likes that except my wife. She's good at that stuff. I'm not. (laughs) You have to answer emails, phone calls, things like that. And then, of course, there's the sermon coming up on Sunday. Oh, by the way, you got to do that too. It's interesting. Now, I've learned something, that I am much more efficient and effective when I do that work from home. If I try to do it here at the church, it's a guarantee that I'm going to get interrupted. It's going to happen. Some people come in, and maybe they think they have an emergency that God can't solve. they got to see Gene about it. (laughs) Maybe it's someone trying to sell me something that's incredibly common. (laughs) As my wife, yes. They want to sell us something. But all of the time, they're unannounced. I feel like sitting here, opening up all the doors, sitting at my desk, waiting. And when someone comes in, say, ah, you're right on time. I've just been waiting for you. That's what I do here. Now, post-2020, there are a lot of people who are also learning this, even outside of the pastoral ministry. And I've heard that some people can do their entire job from home, unlike me. So they're doing that. And I heard a story of one such guy who was working from home, and he learned something that I found out a long time ago. If you're going to work from home the whole day, it's a good idea to get out of the house here and there. Right? Go crazy. Get some fresh air, especially here in southwest Florida. Just get out of the house, refresh your mind, pray. Right? Good idea. And so you can come up with excuses to get out of the house. Maybe it's checking the mail. That's fun. Right? 
taking the garbage cans in or out, that's not fun. Maybe just taking a walk around the block. I think that's fun. That's when I pray a lot. And so, this guy's day started out like this, with a cup of coffee. Drank his coffee, checked his emails. And before he knew it, he was two hours deep in work. He said, oh, I'm going to get out of the house now. I'll take the garbage cans in from last night. They've been out there. So he leaves the house, and he goes to take the cans in. As he's on the sidewalk, he notices out of the corner of his eye this flag in the distance, triangle flag. Attached to it at the bottom is a tricycle with a little boy riding it, really fast for a little boy. As he gets closer, he notices on the boy's face is a look of determination, very determined. Gets closer and closer, faster and faster. He says, you know what? I'm going to get off the sidewalk because this kid is not stopping for me. So he gets off the sidewalk and the kid whoop, zooms right by. Doesn't think anything of it. Fine. Goes back inside. Starts working again. You know how you do this? You get working on your computer and you start here and then you end up here. You ever do that? You get really into it. Notice this. His eyes are straining. Says, I got to get out. Check the mail. Great excuse. So, if you're new here to Southwest Florida, this is how you check the mail. All right. You don't just go stick your hand in there because you don't know what's going to be in the mailbox. Lizards, spiders, all kinds of weird creatures that we have down here. All right, so he checks the mail, he gets the all clear. He goes in and takes the mail out. Sure enough, there's flag again. Tricycle boy, moving fast. Same look of determination on his face. Zoom right by. I guess we're on the same schedule. He goes inside, works for another couple hours, and decides, I'm going to go out and take my walk. Puts his sneakers on, goes outside the house, on the sidewalk, and sure enough, there's the boy again. Same look of determination on his face, going really fast. Gets off the sidewalk, zoom. We really are on the same schedule. So he goes out for the walk, about a half hour around his neighborhood. Comes back to his block. Like me, he lives on like a circle. So there's a group of houses with a sidewalk that goes around it. And sure enough, as he's coming back in the distance, he notices the little flag peeking up over the hedgerow. And sure enough, the boy turns the corner. Okay. What's going on here? Is this boy really just riding around and around and around and around the block all day? All right, let me see. So he waits a few minutes. He's across the street. Sure enough, comes back around the block. I got to know what's going on. So he crosses the street, gets in the middle of the sidewalk where the boy predictably is going to be, right? He comes right at him, but the man says, stop! The boy obeys, but he doesn't lose that look of determination. The man says, what are you doing? The boy says, I'm running away from home. <laughs> the look of determination falls from his face at that point. And the boy says, but my mom told me not to cross the street. <laughs> Funny picture of obedience. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we saw that Abraham, we were in Genesis, was a man of great faith. Today, we'll see that a part of that faith was his obedience. And today, we'll see that true faith does require action. He was counted as righteous before he got circumcised, but he did pick up and move. That was the action of his faith. Hebrews 11.8, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land. And we'll see another thing today, too. We saw that Abraham was a person of true faith. And true faith comes from a changed heart. We talked about the circumcised heart. We talked about covenants. And we saw that, in fact, God's commands must be written on our hearts. 
We looked at Genesis 15 and 17. We talked about covenants. We saw a name change. Went from Abraham to Abraham, the father of the multitude, exalted father to the father of many. And we see that in the New Testament, I don't know how many people have caught this, when we see the commentary on it, it's usually Abraham, even when they're talking about him when he's Abram. They're looking back at the story. So we're going to use it like that today as well. Abram, Abraham, tomato, tomato. So if we start off in chapter 15, at the initiation of the covenant, we saw that Abraham, Abram, was worried about not having an heir. So that's what he's worried about here. He thinks his servant, Eliezer, is going to get his inheritance. That's it. But the Lord corrects that. He says this, Genesis 15, 5. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Then, between the covenants, something happens. We see this, Genesis 6, 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal, so Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. We did see that Abraham, or Abram, had faith, but he didn't always have patience. Neither did Sarah or Sarai. Hey, honey, I can't get pregnant fast enough, so sleep with my slave. Sounds like a good plan. Now, before we blame Sarah or Sarai, we must notice that Abram did the same thing Adam did. Okay, sounds like a great idea. Doesn't look like patience to me. And we'll see that that lack of patience causes problems. Abram tries to initiate his part of the covenant. Not with patience here. Genesis 16, 4. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. (laughs) I put my servant into your arms. But now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Then Abram calmly looked over the morning paper, lowered his glasses and said, that's not in there. Look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. So Abram's got a serious domestic problem on his hands here. Abram tries to fulfill God's promise in a human attempt. This is what it says in our New Testament commentary in Galatians 4.22. The scriptures say that Abraham, notice, had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. So if we fast forward a bit, Isaac is born, the son of the promise. And then this is what happens, Genesis 21, 8. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her. I'm sorry, in front of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. 
But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba, the well of the oath. So we see the consequences here of the human attempt. And indeed, that son Ishmael goes on to cause problems. When Hagar runs away, the angel tells her to go back. And he says this, This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against his relatives. And sure enough, Genesis 25, 18, Ishmael's descendants occupied the region from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt in the direction of Asher. There they lived in open hostility toward all their relatives. And we'll see later when Esau has a couple of spite marriages. He's mad about his inheritance. He marries one of Ishmael's descendants. Joseph will get sold into slavery to Ishmaelite slave traders. A lot of connections here. Now, if we go back to Genesis 15 and 17, we're going to see that Abraham and Sarah had a lot of disbelief. They did not believe in it. Abraham is told he will have another son through Sarah. But note how Abraham still thinks he did his part in producing an heir in Ishmael. Genesis 17, 17, and Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. But God replied, no, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. And later, Sarah laughs too. You ever eavesdrop on anybody? Remember those three men I talked about? I told you there was more to it. Two of them go to rescue Lot and his family before Sodom is destroyed and the Lord stays with Abraham. Well, if we back up, there's a conversation that goes on with these men. Before Sodom, they're talking to Abraham. Genesis 18.10, then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children, so she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn-out old woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is so old? But God heard her. <laughs> then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Well, Sarah not only Eve drops, laughs at the Lord, but then she lies. 1815, Sarah was so afraid, she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, no, you did laugh. So that's why God says you'll name him Isaac, because Isaac means he laughs. Genesis 21.1, the Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will Laugh with me. Now, we get to a story that many of you probably know. This is a story about complete obedience. At this point in the story, here's where all the doubt, 
the negotiating, the impatience, the laughter all goes away. A story, a beloved story about complete obedience. You see, the Lord decides to test Abraham. He says, Abraham? Abraham says, here I am. I want you to sacrifice your only son, the son that you love, as a whole burnt offering. Go to Moriah, to a mountain I'll tell you about, and sacrifice him there. The next morning, Abraham gets up early, saddles a donkey, grabs two of his servants. Of course, his son Isaac, he chops some wood for the burnt offering, and he sets out, three-day journey. He sees the mountain. He tells the servants, wait here with the donkey. The boy and I, we're going to go and worship, and we'll be back. Hmm. So he puts the wood on Isaac's back. He grabs a knife and fire. He's going to sacrifice him, and then it's a burnt offering and burn him. They head out. Now, Isaac must be an observant young fellow because he says, Father, Abraham says, here I am. We have the wood and the knife, but where's the sheep for the offering? Abraham says, God will provide the sheep, or literally, God will see. They go to the mountain. Abraham sets up the altar, binds Isaac, puts him on the altar, gets the knife, and he's about to slaughter his son. An angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't lay a hand on him. Don't kill your son. For now, I know you truly fear the Lord because you were willing to give up your son. Abraham looks up, sees a ram caught in the thicket in the bushes. He sacrifices that instead of his son. Names the place the Lord will provide or the Lord will see. Indeed, the Lord saw Abraham's obedience, a picture of absolute obedience. Genesis 22:15. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name, I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants seed beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Because you obeyed me. We cannot have faith apart from obedience. Obedience is a part of faith. We continue reading, and we see that as all humans do, Sarah dies. To dust you will return. Ripe old age of 127, she's buried in a cave at Machpelah. Here's an interesting account, a little side story almost, of Abraham's integrity. It's pretty interesting. The Hittites own the cave, and they view him as an exalted father, a prince of the land. So they just want to give it to him. But Abraham says, nope, I'm paying for it. Get an exchange back and forth until a guy named Ephron says, okay, fine. It's worth 400 shekels of silver. You can have it. And so Abraham buys the cave. What a lot of people don't know is Abraham has another wife, at least, her name is Keturah. He has at least six children with her. He does an interesting thing. He sends them away like he sends away Ishmael. Genesis 25, 5. Abraham gave everything he owned to his son Isaac, but before he died, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them off to a land in the east, away from Isaac. You see, Isaac was the 
seed who would inherit the land. Genesis 12, 7, if we go back there, we see this. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. The word there in both Hebrew and Greek is seed. I will give this land to your seed. Singular. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. So it's pretty remarkable (laughs) that Abram, Abraham, would kill this seed. And many point to a moral dilemma, seemingly created by that sacrifice account. How could God ask someone to kill their son? And how could Abraham do it? Well, there are many who have different opinions about this. A lot of opinions. Many, many commentaries have been written about this account. And knowing the word of the Lord, I'll say it was an exercise in futility because the commentary was right under their nose the whole time. They just needed to take the time to keep on reading. All the way to Hebrews, here is what the best commentary we have on the Old Testament says. Hebrews eleven seventeen. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your seed will be counted. The answer. Abraham reasoned that If Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Moral dilemma solved. Imagine that. The Bible has the answers in it. Amazing. You see, he knew God could raise his son from the dead. That's the kind of faith he had. We'll be back, he says to his servants. Another answer right there. Well, God did indeed raise his seed back from the dead. We see a little more commentary when we read Galatians. We're going to dig in a little deeper at Bible study. But check this out. Galatians 3.16. God gave the promises to Abraham and his Seed, it says in Greek. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, plural, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, his seed. And that, of course, means Christ. We have the rest of this sacrifice story here. There are parallels to Christ. There is certainly a foreshadowing of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and the three-day journey. The fact that Isaac is removed. The fact that God provides a lamb, a ram, just a male sheep. He provides the lamb of God. But more stunning is the foreshadowing of the Lord carrying the cross. In Isaac, as he carries the wood he's about to be sacrificed on. We have another amazing foreshadowing, if you dig deep. 2,000 years apart, on, some say, that very same mountain, Mount Moriah, where Isaac was spared. But this time, God provides a different sacrifice. His own son. Abraham is the first to sacrifice on this mountain. And through his seed, that is Christ, Jesus would be the last required sacrifice on that mountain. As the ram, lamb was the substitute for Isaac, the lamb of God is the substitute for us. God did what Abraham would not have to. 
John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Everyone who believes, everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ, then by the grace of God, we are saved. We saw in Romans, Paul's making the point that Abraham is counted as righteous by his faith. We see it in Galatians 2, Galatians 3, 5. I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. At first glance, it seems as if there is nothing we need to do if we select passages. Just pick the parts we want. But if we look at the full counsel of God's word, we see both sides of the coin here. Regarding faith, James 2 gives us the other side of that coin, specifically regarding Abraham's faith. And we do see something here. James 2, 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions? Huh? Read it again. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, this faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as scriptures say. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not faith alone. Now, before you're like, what? That's God's words, not mine. Remember that. Not by faith alone. Now, some have said that early Christians were doing something that we do too today. They were picking their favorite verses. Right? And they're like, well, we could do whatever we want. Right? You just got to believe, and of course, I can just sin, sin, sin. Paul addresses it. Should we sin so that God's grace may abound? Absolutely not. No. Some say that James is almost countering Paul here. Paul's not wrong. He's right. It's the word of God, but it needs completion. People are running with it, this greasy grace that we even do today. James uses the example of Abraham to give the early believers and us the other side of the coin. Yes, we're saved. Grace, faith in Jesus Christ. But it should produce actions, don't you think? Yes, his faith and his actions worked together. If we're going around saying, we have faith, I have faith, then we must have obedience. James 2.17, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone might argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. Ah, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Again, the Word of God tells us just saying we have faith is not enough. We have to be doers of the Word. There's obedience required. Unless we show it by our obedience to the Word, we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ if it is genuine, if we really mean it. And true and genuine faith will cause acts of obedience. Jesus says the following, in case you didn't believe his brother James. John 14, 21, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. 
and I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. Jesus requires genuine faith, like knowing that Sarah is eavesdropping. He knows what's in our hearts. True faith produces obedience. We saw that we must have God's commands written on our hearts. And it is a faithful heart that beats in obedience. Jesus walked in obedience when he endured the cross. Hebrews says this, Hebrews 5, 7, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. The author will move on to talk about people of faith, like Abraham, Sarah, and others. Then he says this, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. You may ask, how? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for this church. May you fill us with passion for Jesus and compassion for those for whom he died. Help us to walk in obedience this week to your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. May the grace and peace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.